And so, hello everyone. Um, welcome back to uh, Essex seminar series. Um, you know then because of the shutdown, we have uh, moved our seminar online. And you can find uh, out uh, our schedule on our website. And today, um, this is the first of our uh, virtual seminar. Um, just so you know that uh, the seminar is being recorded. Uh, the recording include um, both the presentation and the questions. Um, and we will put the recording on ASIC YouTube channel. Um, and today's agenda is that um, first we will have the speaker um, do his presentation. Um, and then we will um, uh, move to the uh, question sessions. Uh, you are welcome to bring up um, any questions either after the presentation or um, in the presentation. Um, and to ask a question, you can either um, uh, do this by through text. You can send a message to the moderator through. And you can see on the uh, right side of the panel, there is a, a chat. Uh, section you can um, type the questions and send it to to the um, host and the host will bring up um, the questions to the speaker um, you can also ask a vocal question you can raise up your hands um, virtually right panel you can see a, a, a raise hand um, icon you can click the icon and then um, the host um, um, it's me and um, Miss Kathy uh, Medley. We will unmute you so that you can ask a vocal question. Uh, I think uh, that's um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, what I want to say about the procedure. And and I will um, be um, briefly introducing the speaker. So. Um, Today, uh, it's our honor to have Professor Ben Hobbs with us. Um, he is a CERDO and key gender professor of environmental management at uh, the Johns Hopkins University. He has been on the JHU engineering faculty since uh, 1995 and was previously at the Case Western Reserve University. He has also be, been an overseas fellow and the church here, college, Cambridge. And he had visiting appointments at Caltech, University of Washington, Caminas, Pontifical University, and um, in a gentle so called central uh, Netherlands. He does research on using optimization, decision analysis, and economics for power systems management and ecosystem restoration. He received his PhD in environmental systems engineering from Cornell. Um, Professor Hobbs chairs the Castle Market Surveillance Committee and co-directs the Yale HU solutions for energy, air, climate, and health center. He's a fellow of IEEE and informs and this work has been supported by NOAA through the Mid and Net Integrated Science and Assessment Project. And we have a second speaker, um, Ri Si. Um, he's a PhD student at Johns Hopkins. And so, our, uh, let's welcome the speaker virtually, and I will give the ball to. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, John, for the uh, kind introduction and uh, for the invitation here. It's an honor to be the first online Essex speaker. Um, I'm sure everything will go absolutely smoothly as they always do on uh, Zoom and WebEx. If any of you watched Saturday Night Live last Saturday night, you saw a great uh, uh, satire about Zoom meetings. I encourage you to check those out. You all have learned, lived through these and will appreciate it. Um, but I'm sure this will go well because we have uh, Chrysandra helping us and um, 
At any rate, if you have uh, a clarifying question or a quick question, I'm glad to address them uh, in, during the presentation. Um, I cannot see people that raise their hands. So I'll be expecting John to clear his throat and let me know that there's a question. Or, and longer questions you can hold till afterwards. Um, okay, so um, as mentioned, I'm sort of an economist and operations researcher, as is, as is Ray. This is not a common type of speaker for you to have in this session, but I understand you do have occasional social scientists who darken your door. Some of you knew uh, Melissa Kenny, now at the University of uh, Minnesota. She was a postdoc of mine. So if you know her, you might get have a sense of the sort of things that I'm interested in. Um, but here's the basic problem. Where do you put the goalie? What do you do now to position yourself when you don't know the, where the ball is, the climate change ball is coming? Um, you're adapting whether to coastal flooding or increased frequency of droughts or increased frequency of uh, heat waves. You don't know how severe they'll be. And you don't know how effective the actions you might take will be against them. Now, if you're a goalie, probably you'll want to be in the middle, but sometimes you have to decide which way to dive before they've actually kicked the ball. And so there are some risks. Um, and in decision analysis, which is the framework that I uh, use to address these problems, we call the positioning of the goalie and perhaps the pre-commitment to dive in a certain direction, here are the decisions. These are the, these are the investments and commitments you have to make now if you want to be ready for perhaps severe uh, climate changes, sea level rise over the next 20 and 30 years. There are also wait and see decisions or recourse decisions that you can learn you can get some information and you can adjust your strategy. And decision analysis tries to consider both. What should you do now, given the options of adjusting that strategy later and the things that might happen in terms of where Mr. Uh, Rooney will kick the ball? Um, so what's motivating us is that climate adaptation is absolutely essential. Um, we see the impacts now, and they're anticipated to get worse in the future. And for many adaptation actions, it takes a while to implement them and make them fully effective. So if we want to make ourselves less vulnerable, we need to start doing things now in some cases. But this is hard because of these profound uncertainties. Um, by deep uncertainty, I mean not only uncertainties that for which we don't know the probability distribution, there may be uncertainties that we, we can't even, we've never seen events like them before, whether the 2016 uh, presidential election or the COVID virus. But we want to prepare the system for them. Decision analysis can support and, and help us make better adaptation decisions to make us aware of the range of things that could possibly happen and what we can do in the future to flexibly respond to them and what the implications of that is for decisions that we make now. Should we make investments now to make the system more adaptive in the future? Um, one can do uh, very sophisticated uh, dynamic programming on the, under multiple objectives, et cetera, but that takes a lot of precious resources and staff. And so you really want to save those resources for the decisions where such analysis can make an important difference. And so what I'm going to address in the first two parts of this lecture is, first of all, how sophisticated a decision analysis can be justified for a particular adaptation problem. And I'll give a, uh, I'll summarize a six step procedure for thinking about this and a simple example dealing with coastal flooding. And second, if you have a spectrum of problems that you have to deal with, you are the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, you worry about coastal flooding and water supply and um, uh, things like heat waves. If you have some decision analysis resources, staff trained in it, 
time you can spend on it, which problems should you emphasize? And so we have a framework for thinking about that that we actually used within Marissa, which is the RISA that um, uh, we belong to, to prioritize problems to address. And one of the problems we identified as deserving of this attention is managing urban heat waves. And this was what uh, Ray will be talking about. It's his PhD thesis. And instead of vanilla decision analysis uh, with decision trees and Bayes rule, he's actually going to use a, a, a novel method called robust decision making for reasons that he'll explain. And so these are the three parts of the talk. And so first, um, let's uh, look at the six step procedure for deciding how sophisticated we really need to be. So the, the, the simplest type of decision analysis is you have um, a set of possibilities represented by these arcs that you choose from. And this square represents a decision node where you're choosing from these different decisions. And uh, there's one future scenario, a base case or best guess about what the climate's going to do and how effective your adaptation measures might be. Um, you may have a, a criterion of simply minimizing expected costs, or you may have multiple objectives, but that's a relatively simple problem. In reality, though, there's a lot of uncertainty about where sea level rise is going to go and storm severity and so forth. So in which case we might want to consider a chance node with a, a set of scenarios. And we don't know which of these will occur when we make this decision. So time is going from left to right. We make a decision and then the curtain is drawn back and we learn what sort of climate we have or how effective uh, different measures might be. Um, but we're making all decisions ahead of time. An even more sophisticated decision analysis recognizes that we have recourse decisions that after we learn something, we can adjust our decision strategy, abandon some options, invest in some others. Um, so for example, in uh, urban heat islands, uh, dealing with uh, urban heat waves, we can start investing a lot more in, in a forestation in the city, but then it might turn out that a lot of the trees don't survive or that it's very expensive to maintain them. We can abandon that course and instead paint our streets white. So um, a decision analysis considering recourse is it may be worthwhile if considering this flexibility later affects the net benefits of what we commit to now, given these uncertainties. An analysis of this sort will be more expensive, but give more insights than analysis of this sort. And of course, there are even more elaborate analyses with where we make decisions every five years, perhaps, and uncertainties are unfolding through time, but um, two stages is as sophisticated as I'll get here. So the question is, is the more elaborate analysis worth the expense? And that itself is a benefit cost analysis. We get better decisions, but we spend money to identify those decisions. Presently, there's a lack of quantitative tools for thinking about this. So what Ray and I have done is come up with a systematic procedure for deciding, identifying the benefits of doing this type of analysis versus that, and deciding whether the increased benefits are worth it. And this involves six steps, of, which is basically a very simplified decision analysis of each type, where we uh, approximate the benefits of that analysis. Um, the benefits of doing this approximate analysis is that it may also sensitize the stakeholders and managers to the importance of considering later flexibility and later options and how those are affected by the commitments that you make now which may either lock you into a particular trajectory or they may open up more possibilities so first we ask is your basic decision sensitive to the scenario you consider and if you make the wrong decision 
Will you regret that? Are the consequences significantly different or maybe the consequences are pretty much the same no matter what you do? If that's the case, do a simple decision analysis like we had in the lab. If on the other hand, the scenarios matter and you there might be significant regret if you do the wrong thing, is it worthwhile to do a full probabilistic analysis where you consider likelihoods of different scenarios? Does that lead to a different decision and better decisions? And finally, is it worthwhile to actually consider um, recourse? What you might do if, um, um, if you have more flexibility later on, does that have implications for commitments you make now? So here we're gonna apply this procedure to simple uh, flooding management problem. And to illustrate what I mean, and also some basic concept of decision analysis. These basic concepts are the vanilla decision analysis that you would learn in Harvard Business School if you were taking a course from Howard Rafa, who was one of the uh, uh, grandfathers or grandparents of uh, decision analysis. Um, so we have three options. We have a, a substation that may be subject to flooding, and if it's flooded, blackouts, and you may have expensive equipment replacement. Should we build an expensive flood wall to protect it or do nothing? If the equipment is damaged, simply replace it. Maybe the equipment's near the end of its life anyway. Or maybe the likelihood of damage is very low. Or should we wait? Should we see how fast sea level rise um, accelerates? Should we see how the frequency of, this, of extreme storms and storm surges might increase. And if we see evidence of the risks increasing, we can do something later, which will be cheaper. But in the meanwhile, we of course are gonna be living with some risks. So the objectives are just two. Usually in real problems, you have multiple objectives, social, environmental, but here it's just strictly a matter of money. We're trying to minimize expected flood damage and the cost of investing. As I said, this is a vanilla uh, business school type decision problem. And the uncertainties are the extent of future flood damage, which if we have more storm surges and sea level rise will be more severe. So we make a bunch of assumptions inspired by real substation costs. And to make things simple, we consider just a couple of flood damage scenarios. And we consider them in two different periods what might happen in the near term and what might happen in the longer term. Um, in steps one to three, we just ask, is it sensitive to the scenario? Is there significant regret by comparing um, the decision we make under a moderate flood damage scenario in the near term and long term versus high? We ask, does the decision change? And then steps four to six, I'm gonna slap on some probabilities and Bayesian type learning. And I'm only going to consider two flood, uh, flood damage scenarios, low and high. Um, and let's talk about uh, the Bayesian assumptions. We'll get there. So here's a decision. Uh, squares the decision nodes, circles or chance nodes. You enter from the left as time goes on, and you exit to the right. In a chance node, there's a probability of choosing the leaving arcs. Mother Nature throws the dice. In a decision node, you decide what to do which of uh, several things that you do, as you will see. Um, and when we solve this decision tree, we go backwards in time from the end and we pull things to the left. So here's a very simple decision tree of the simplest sort. One scenario, moderate flooding damage. Should we build a flood wall now or should we do nothing? If we do nothing, we don't pay any costs but we have risks of relatively high damages in the near and long term, a total of uh, $5,200 of damage. If we build a flood wall now, we're gonna put $5,000 down in the barrel head, but the damages will be less. So in a decision tree, we consider them all together and it looks like in present worth terms, doing nothing and living with the risk of flood damage is the best thing. 
So that's our decision. And we don't do this. Now I'm going to ask in step two, if we consider a different scenario, would we do the same thing? In which case, a simple analysis is justified. So what if we have an extreme case of high flooding damage instead of 400 and 1,000 if you build a flood wall? It's 1,100 and 2,400 in the next 20 years and then the subsequent 40 years. And if you do nothing, you risk a total of 1,100 11,200 of damages. And you can see that under the extreme scenario, we would do something different. Our costs are minimized by building the flood wall now. So we can see that our best choice is sensitive to scenario. So that suggests we should consider multiple scenarios in making a decision today. We shouldn't just use the base case because we'll make a different decision. Now, wait a second, somebody might say. Just because you make a different decision doesn't mean that the costs are going to be any different. So we have to look at the regret, which is if you make the naive decision from the base case and the extreme case occurs, will you be much worse off? And the answer is yes, you would be a total of um 2700 worse off this difference is the regret so there's significant regret the scenario matters so we should choose multiple scenarios now go to the next step is it worth assigning probabilities to the scenarios and is it worth considering recourse options and to do a probabilistic analysis, we have to do things such as a, assign probabilities to low versus high probabilities of, um, of a damage in the long run. Uh, we have to consider what we learn over time. For example, if in the long run, damage is gonna be high because we have significant sea level rise or increased probabilities of high storm surges, What's the likelihood that we would see low damage versus high damage in the short run? After all, we might be lucky. Maybe the climate is changing in a way that we're going to have a lot more damage, but that we don't see much happening, not much happens in the next 10 to 20 years. There's a chance of that. So these are called conditional probabilities. And then we apply Bayes' law to figure out, okay, we wake up in the year, um, 2040 or 2035, we haven't seen much damage. What's the likelihood that we're not going to see much damage after that? Relatively high. On the other hand, if we've seen high damage, then there's a higher probability we'll see high damage in the long run. So this is called learning in this phase law. So first, stage four, no recourse, but we consider probabilities of low versus high damage in the in the short run and low versus high damage is the longer run and we find out that in terms of expected damages building a flood wall now has a slight advantage not very large but a slight advantage um and so that's what we might do so that differs from what we did under the deterministic analysis where we considered the moderate scenario. So it looks like considering multiple scenarios has made a difference. Now let's ask about recourse. In recourse, we can do something like not do anything today, but down the road in 20 years, we could install flood proofing then. That's what we do in step five is to think about what is the flexibility that we have? So you can wait and see, and then depending on whether flood damage is low or high, you could decide to install uh, the flood proofing. And what we see here is if flood damages are low in the next 20 years, ah, just don't bother protecting the substation. That's cheaper by a slight. But on the other hand, if the flood damage was high, then you're better off installing at that point um, the, the flood protection. 
And now what we see is that this flexibility may improve the strategy. When you do something different, depending on what you've learned, there's a value of information. And it turns out in this case, it's worthwhile waiting and seeing. Um, and that's the best strategy at all. So we do a different decision if we consider recourse than if we don't. So a sophisticated analysis uh, might save us what well, looks like about 400, uh, in this case, $400,000. So if the cost of doing the analysis is a good deal less than that, then it, it might be worthwhile doing it. Um, I want to get on to raise urban heat analysis. So uh, let's skip the conclusions here, except to say that balancing the benefits of more sophisticated analysis and making better decisions against their cost. So the second part of this talk, uh, quickly, I want to take a look at the range of decisions that we considered analyzing in Marissa and how we compared those. We couldn't do this sophisticated six-step analysis with each of them, but we could look at their characteristics and say, those decisions look like they may be worthwhile to invest in analysis, but these other ones are not. So this is an analysis that considers the portfolio problems that something like Maryland Department of Natural Resources and Maryland Department of Environment might face. And asks, which of these should you spend your scarce decision analysis resources on? Heat waves or coastal flooding or um, urban water supply or something else. So we rank these using a multi-criteria decision analysis where we've come up with uh, approximately 10 criteria that indicate whether a problem is important and might benefit from decision analysis. And we apply these to mid-Atlantic decisions. So there are three sets of general criteria. Is the decision suitable for decision analysis in that there are uncertainties that are uh, the, the problem is impacted by climate. You have complex alternatives, both in the near term and then down the road, that make the decision non obvious. You also have to ask is it a, the decision important or trivial? Urgent to the short run, large amount of benefits. And maybe there are other objectives, such as co benefits. For example, if you have urban afforestation for cooling, maybe you also have aesthetic benefits and energy built benefits, and are those uh, uh, significant? And finally, is there some prospect that you could actually use numbers and that they might give you some insight on? And do you have a partner to work with? And so basically we rated approximately 20 problems on these nine criteria and uh, we weighted the criteria and then highlighted the problem that looked like they're most important in terms of fitness, importance, and measurable performance. So we looked at uh, problems in the Susquehanna, Potomac, James River basins, and along the coast of the Chesapeake Bay, um, and identified partners. And this is what we did in our first year of the Marissa. And then we decided what problems we're going to focus on in our, our subsequent years. And, uh, and what we're focusing on now is small town flooding, like Ellicott City, coastal flooding, and um, uh, urban heat problems. But here are the problems that we considered, from electric substations to protecting coastal marshes to figuring out what are the TMDLs. Um, and urban heat islands. So um, there are a bunch of other problems besides these that we, that we screened out as being basically the low rating in all of these. And then within each of the three major categories, here's the rating of the problems. And what we see is that there are a couple of problems, coastal uh, protection and land acquisition that came up over and over again as important. And then in other categories, so did green infrastructure, 
for cities, green infrastructure for urban water runoff, and finally, urban heat island. And what we ultimately decided to do in Marissa was to choose uh, one problem for each of these categories, coastal flooding, urban storm water, and urban heat. And what it, um, uh, Ray is about to tell you about is the urban heat island case. So uh, with no further, I'll just simply say that this is a process that a, an agency like MDNR or EPA or somebody else could use to figure out where to devote its resources for hiring consultants or internal staff resources for sophisticated decision analysis. And uh, Ray, I'm going to hand this to you. So um, I think I can relinquish my screen. Thank you. Ray, she's, Ray, she's, she's, now. Uh, he's got his master's degree from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Ben, and I will uh, continue the presentation. So, um, can anyone see this screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, cool. So uh, in the first two parts, Ben have already introduced that the two practical tools that we can use in general. And we have already seen the application of the second tools to compare the multiple uh, adaptation problems in the uh, Marisa regions that the urban heat adaptation problem is a highly ranked problem. So here in the, in the third part, we want to ensure us again with the first tool we develop to show uh, why these problems should be addressed by a comprehensive decision analysis, considering uh, multiple um, scenarios and also multi uh, decision stages and how we can do that. So uh, in addition to applying the first tool uh, to a hypothetical coastal flooding management problem, here we will apply the tool to a real world case study for the urban heat adaptation problem for the city of Baltimore. And before I jump into the uh, analysis and results, uh, let's see um, what three elements make these problems uh, interesting and uh, challenging. So the first, let's look at um, what climate models tell us about the future heat wave will look like in the Baltimore. So here I grab uh, multiple models from the North American Codex data archive. So basically they are all um, maximum daily temperature projections. And I used a definition of heat wave in previous literature to uh, transform that uh, temperature projection to heat wave projections. And uh, obviously you can see um, different models tell us uh, different stories. So basically you can see here, the model with the green lines tell us, oh, there will be a lot of heat waves in the future um, 20 years. And even in some years, the heat wave days can last uh, 90 days uh, during the summer. On the other hand, uh, some other um, climate model shows that there will be only very limited uh, heat waves, which might um, be a very, uh, uh, limited impact on human health. So given this uncertainty and um, how our planning can address the uncertainty. And also in addition to the climate uncertainty, there might be another type of uncertainties uh, like how the vulnerable, vulnerable population can change in the future and how effective, the, how effective your adaptation strategies can be. So addressing the uncertainty is the first layer of challenge of the urban heat adaptation problem. And then the second type of challenge this problem face is the geographical differences in heat risks. So um, similar to the urban heat island effect, you know, even within a city that because you have different land use, uh, the temperature across different areas within a city can be uh, significantly different. So this is a map of uh, model estimated neighborhood temperature differences. And you can see uh, the downtown areas with most impervious services are much hotter than the surrounded um, places with more uh, green space and open space. Also, um, the population's vulnerability to heat is um, different. Uh, generally, low income and el elderly people uh, has higher vulnerability than the young and rich people. But this population are also uh, unevenly distributed within the city. So given these factors, your policy has to has to um, address the geographical differences uh, for your decisions. Um, so that's the second type of challenges this problem face. 
But also, uh, thirdly, you have a lot of uh, available options that you can do to mitigate the urban heat. For example, you can do the urban uh, forestries, you can do the cool pavement, uh, cool roofs, or you just open the cooling centers during the summer. And those different actions have different properties. So for example, uh, the first three actions are uh, basically temperature reduction uh, actions. They can reduce the city temperature, but they have different co unit costs. Like for the trees, you have to purchase the trees, plant the trees, and which costs a lot for the cities. And you know, uh, you put a small tree today, it takes uh, many years for the tree to grow to its uh, maximum canopy. So the benefit of the uh, tree's temperature reduction can be delayed. But on the other hand, the cool roof and the cool pavement, um, they, once you paint the uh, street or roof to a light color, it will increase the uh, uh, albedo and it will reduce the temperature immediately. And they also have uh, less cost than, uh, than the uh, trees. Uh, but another type of action is the uh, cooling centers. It will not reduce the city temperature. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, it provides shelters that people, especially the uh, vulnerable people, can go during the heat wave. So it avoids them to expose to the uh, heat mortality during the heat waves to save their life. So the third type of challenge is you have many options. You must decide it which combinations of these uh, individual actions is a, which is the best and to what extent you do the uh, each uh, actions. So as a short summary, uh, we want to um, do urban heat adaptation planning for Baltimore for the next two decades. And we will consider uh, multiple aspects as I just introduced. And here I will summarize them again, use a X long framework uh, where the X stands for the uncertainties. So uh, in addition to the climate uncertainty I just described at the beginning, um, we will also consider about the social economic uncertainties, like um, what the total population will be in the future in Baltimore, whether there will be um, more um, population or less population in the city. And also uh, for the age structure, whether there will be more older people or more younger people in the future. Uh, in addition, the uh, real discount rate is another concern because it will affect our decision for investment in today and in the future. Another layer of uncertainty is the uh, effectiveness of different actions. So what if we plant the trees, but it don't reduce temperature as we imagined? And what if we uh, open a cooling center, but it turns out very, very few people use it? So uh, overall, there will be 11 uncertain model parameters in our case study. And the one combination of those parameter values define a scenario in our case. And the second part of the study is called uh, the policy levers, which stands for, uh, which is the L. Um, basically, they are refers to the uh, strategies that we will use to uh, reduce the uh, uh, heat risks. Uh, and one strategy can consist with um, of uh, different combination of individual actions we just talked about. And we will allow two decision stages. So basically, you can uh, invest in the near term or in the later term. And by some uh, models, we can map your decisions and these uncertainties uh, to some uh, 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 mortality results so you can evaluate your uh, decisions. So, so first, we will use a, a land use regression model and some temperature measurement uh, from the Johns Hopkins University within Baltimore to infer a, 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 city a, a sub city level uh, temperature distribution within the city. And then we will use a, a exposure response function to map the heat to the actual mortality with and without adaptation. So you, so in this sense, you can measure um, what your um, policy effect is. And then we will calculate the financial cost in terms of the net present value of all the uh, actions you implemented. And in this study, we consider uh, multiple objectives. Uh, for example, we want to reduce the heat related mortality as many as possible, but on the other hand, we don't want to spend like trillions of dollars uh, in it. And maybe in the future, some other co benefits like the uh, energy savings and the neighborhood beautification will be added in this analysis. But for today's presentation, I will just focus on the first two. So, okay, uh, there are many um, hints that these problems can be. Uh, a problem that can benefit from a comprehensive analysis. But before I uh, spend my uh, 
PhD careers into analyzing this problem, I want to use the first uh, tools we just developed to uh, make sure that these problems can benefit from a comprehensive analysis. So um, back to the uh, tools we just introduced. So the first three steps ask whether the decisions are sensitive to the scenarios. So here I will just show you that uh, there are three scenarios um, by different color in this figure and uh, what's their mortality reduction can be achieved by different level of investment. So here you can see in scenario one, the high level investment is justified because when you investment more money, you can save many more lives. And for the scenario two, you can see the median level investment is acceptable because after about 600 millions, uh, merely no uh, mortality reduction is uh, achieved. And for scenario three, a uh, low level investment turns out to be sufficient because even you add more money, you, there is no additional mortality reduction will be achieved. So the answer to this question is yes, the optimal level of investment depends on which scenarios you assumed. So, and whether there will be a significant regret. So in this case, it will have two types of regret. The first one is we call vulnerability regret, where is the lives you could save but you didn't. So for example, if you planned for the scenario three and you go for the um, low level investment and uh, in reality, the scenario one happens, you will miss the opportunities to save thousands of lives. And on the other hand, you might also have an investment regret where is the additional money you spend but saving no additional lives. So if you plan for the scenario one and you go for a high level investment but it turns out that scenario three happens, you will waste uh, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars in this case, so it will have a significant investment regret. So by this sense, we can see this problem has passed the uh, three steps, first three steps check. So now let's look at the uh, next part. So here we will consider multiple scenarios and uh, adaptive strategies. And uh, so here we, um, don't use the decision tree again, but instead we use a uh, called robust decision making where we will not assign probabilities for individual uh, uh, scenarios, but we will compare them together. So, and as an initial check uh, for the simplicity, I will compare the four static strategies and three adaptive strategies across uh, multiple scenarios. So basically uh, the stat a static strategy uh, only involves the here and now, here and now investment so you will have made a decision today and you will stick for it, uh, stick to it for the next 20 years. And the four strategies represent four investment levels in our And uh, uh, by contrast, the adaptive strategies, they start from low investment and adapt in a later decision stage if needed. And the three strategies we look at here have different threshold indicating the later, the necessity of later uh, adaptation. So, um, so for the further simplification, I assume all the decisions are, are identical across the city. So by far, the analysis didn't consider geographic differences. And I think it's, it's still uh, sufficient to uh, see whether the whether consider multiple scenarios and the adaptive strategies helps us uh, get a better decision. So uh, there are the four um, static strategies we just mentioned, starting from the low investment level cooling center only strategy to the high investment level all-in strategy, where basically you do everything you can and you decided all of them today. And in addition, we compare the, we have three adaptive strategies. They start with a low level investment. They only do including center in the near term. And uh, when it comes to the future, uh, your, your investment will depend on the, the, which scenario you observe. And uh, the three um, words, conservative, moderate, and ag aggressive, uh, indicates the, um, the, heat, the, heat, the how many heat waves will trigger additional investment. So they vary uh, in the three strategies. And uh, simply saying that the conservative uh, adaptive strategy is when you uh, observe a lot of heat waves, you will adapt. But on the other hand, the, 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 aggressive, the aggressive adaptive strategy, uh, you will adapt when you see a few, uh, uh, a few heat waves compared to the conservative ones and the moder um, and the moderate one is in somewhere between these two. So uh, with these seven strategies, we want to um, 
evaluate them in an ensemble of a thousand scenarios. So we are not um, optimized uh, in a given scenario, by, but we look at uh, big pictures to compare them uh, in different uh, scenarios, like uh, stress testing for them. So uh, in this sense, we do need a matrix um, to, say, to, to say which one is the best. So in our case, because we are emphasizing the robustness, so we define a robust solution using a regret best ro ro robustness approach where we want to find the strategy that has the most acceptable regret scenarios out of the assailant. So for example, um, based, on, uh, based on some criteria, we might, might find a strategy um, can have 900 scenarios with acceptable regrets across the assailant one, and others strategies only have 100. So that strategy with 900 will be the uh, robust solution for us. And in our case, uh, the acceptable regret are identified are defined by within a acceptable range deviated from the optimal strategy in a given scenario. So we choose that uh, acceptable regret scenario is that strategy has less than a hundred deaths over uh, more than the deaths in the scenario optimum, and the cost of it will have less than a hundred million than optimum. And to define a scenario optimum in a given scenario we define it as a strategy that meets the targets of less than 200 uh, deaths and the cost of list. So by this definition, we can count uh, each of the seven strategies, how many scenarios uh, are with uh, acceptable regrets of, for each of them. And the one has the most uh, robust scenarios count will be the uh, robust solution in our case. So, so here, let me just show the uh, results. And you can see here, the three bottom adaptive strategies have a significantly more robust uh, scenarios than the um, four static one. So we know that the owing strategy can save the most of life, but it will spend a lot of money, which in many scenarios, it turns out unnecessary. And on the other hand, the cooling centers, it spend least money, but in many other scenarios, uh, it will miss the opportunity to save many, many lives. But um, so the adaptive strategies, which start from the cooling centers and have the flexibility to adapt, can take the advantages of both the two uh, strategies that further improve the uh, performance. So that's why you see that the adaptive strategies has a higher, um, has a higher um, scenarios with acceptable regrets compared to the static uh, strategies. So um, by going through this um, screening process, we can see that uh, consider multiple scenarios and also further adaptive, uh, adaptive options in this case can find us to identify a, a better solution. And here is the moderate adaptive strategy. But let's take a look at even within the uh, best solution, best strategy so far, it only has less than 600 of scenario with acceptable regrets. I'm, I, I think we still have room to further find a better strategies in this case. So uh, in this sense, it will involve uh, further, um, further research, which I will not talk today. But basically, I will uh, first explore a richer set of strategies. So uh, in the previous analysis, I just showed, I uh, compared the seven strategies, four static and uh, three adaptives. Um, but uh, I, will, I will explore a richer set of strategies by using some um, complicated genetic algorithm to first identify optimal strategy under each of the uh, hundreds of scenarios, and then use those strategies as basis for the further analysis. So the matrix uh, we use to compare the robustness is still applic applicable for those strategies too. And uh, for the other aspect, I will address the geographic differentiation. So uh, in in, the, in, in this analysis, I just show that we consider all the decisions are the same for the whole city. But in the future, we will allow the different strategies to be taken in different um, planning districts in Baltimore. And the, the, the strategies will be evaluated at the census track level. So it will help us understand um, what kind of uh, adapti uh, adaptation strategies can lead to a census track level um, health impacts. And for the third point, as I said, we will further consider the co-benefits 
um, such as uh, um, air pollution reduction and aesthetic improvement from the urban trees, or maybe some energy saving benefits from um, painting a roof. And finally, we will try to visualize the results uh, in some interactive maps. So um, the city planners and the stakeholders, uh, they can explore those strategies uh, to understand the trade-offs between the uh, financial costs and uh, the health benefits of um, different strategies across a wide range of uh, uncertainty. So um, this is uh, the, the, the um, research and uh, this is a result I got so far. And I think Ben can take over to make a, a conclusion for our uh, presentation. And do you want to say something? Thank you, Ray. Um, and thank you everybody for listening. So you've heard us describe uh, the considerations we think are relevant to deciding whether it's worthwhile to do a sophisticated multi-scenario uh, decision analysis with recourse options down the road to address climate adaptation problems. And uh, we saw that it made a difference in a hypothetical problem. And Ray is finding that it makes a, an appreciable difference in how um, by what recommendations would be made for a city like Baltimore uh, to prepare itself for the possibility of a much higher frequency of uh, heat waves in the future. And um, I realize it's five of three, but maybe we have time for a question or two. Uh, John? And so is there any questions? So I, I do have some some chat questions and while I can, I can ask the chat questions while people, I don't know, find the raise hand button or anything like that, that should be, it should be under the um, participants. There should be like a little hand icon. Oh, there we are. Um, actually, yeah, we can just start with this person um, that has their hand raised. I'm going to unmute you. So there you go. You should be able to talk now. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, my question is a little bit more academic, not to you see you did excellent work on the application of this method. But my question to Ray is say, because uh, you see the robust decision making, the adaptation pathway, and this kind of thing, from a, a pure academic viewpoint, they are already there, you see, mature. So if you do PhD dissertation, what is your contribution, your additional contribution? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, basically, I think um, I saw previous studies that to use the heat wave management, but I don't think uh, they address the uncertainty as well. So the first contribution I think I have addressed, um, I will address multiple sources of uncertainty in my dissertation. And uh, also, um, and also, um, I think I think the um, to uh, mapping this um, problems under a, a, a pre so previous studies they like uh, answer the what if question I think, but they are overlook uh, some important uh, aspects of the how to questions like how we can uh, decide which to do in near term, and which to do in the long term. So, and, and also address the uh, trade offs in the cost and the mortalities. So, that will be another uh, contributions. Um, I, I think you, you, what the, one of your contributions is say, because in the standard uh, method, for example, in your X matrix, then they select because you have so many combinations. Mm -hmm. They just use the mathematical sampling, yeah, use some certain kind of sampling, sample the uh, uh, get some support scenarios because otherwise you have no way to analyze so many scenarios. But you combine the, the uh, scenario with the no regret. So you use log regret as kind of additional perspective to select rather than mechanically use mathematics. You use more uh, decision making ideas. So I yeah. think it's very important. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I can also go ahead and ask. I have two chat questions. Um, 
the first, which was like in the middle of your talk, so maybe it's not relevant anymore, was how do you define heat wave days? Okay, so um, the definition is basically referred to the um, an article that by um, Roger Cohn from the Johns Hopkins University, where he used a two threshold, where is the uh, 81st um, percentile and where is the 95th percentile. So first, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, threshold definition, but uh, to put it simple, it's to make sure the days, there is a con continued days at above this two threshold. And you need to uh, check the overall over uh, overall the maximum average average maximum daily temperature, and also you need to have your each day's temperature above the threshold. So it's uh, complicated. And if you, uh, the audience are interested, uh, you can search for the uh, Roger Pons paper, and and we use the definition and uh, the exposure response function um, identical, consistent in that paper to make. To make sure the heat wave stress and the mortality estimation are consistent. Thanks. Um, and then the second online question is: Have you considered using machine learning, like neural networking, to help optimize the decision analysis? Uh, by this, we 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 didn't, but it could be a one because we because uh, I'm trying to use uh, uh, called genetic algorithm to solve for the optimization problem under each. Uh, given scenario in the in the future analysis, so uh, the neural network might be a, a possible option. I'm not sure now, but I will definitely check it. Um, check it's a possibility. Great, sounds good. All right. Um, so um, thank you so much for for the great presentation, and um, I also thank the attendees um, for showing up. Um, and I think um, we, I think um, we, we can ramp up here. And um, on behalf of the attendees, I will give you some virtual um, applause. <laughs> and um, and just so you know that um, you can check out uh, the recordings on the ASIC YouTube um, channel. Um, if you miss out the the the, the um, online presentation, you can always go to our um, ASIC YouTube channel to um, check out their um, um, re video recordings. Uh, so I think that's it. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. It sounds sounds great. Here, I'll give you some claps. It feels kind of weird to end on a quiet note. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to get used to this. Forward to see you at next week's seminar, which sounds uh, very interesting indeed. So, if you don't mind, uh, uh, folks from Hopkins uh, uh, crashing your party. Yeah, please do. More the merrier. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.